Okay. Anyway, uh, it, it is, it's a pleasure, especially because uh, I've had really two uh, long-term relationships with institutions in my in, in my uh, adult life. Uh, one of which is uh, Western, and one that I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, in, in a few minutes in, in Dupont. And I was sharing over lunch that uh, I believe I may have the record for being the most ha having been registered in continuously as a as a Western student longer than perhaps anybody else because I was a Western student registered from age 17 to age 30. And so I paid tuition for an entire 13 year period, so that's probably why you decided to invite me back today. The, the part of that though, I, I didn't actually spend uh, the entire 13 years here in, in, uh, in London. I spent the first part of that time, but I spent the, the last six years of that period in, in, uh, in France in one of the uh, exchange programs that Western was prototyping at the time where I did my research for my PhD at, uh, in Compiègne, I found my wife there, and, and then uh, came back and submitted my thesis uh, sometime after here, here at Western. And I'm going to come back to that topic because one of the things I want to touch on uh, as, as, as in part of my talk is, it, is some of the things that I learned in the process of having, as you heard in the introduction, a, a relatively large number of international assignments over time. And, and, and it was it was as a result of Western that I was able to embark on that path. In fact, uh, when I became an exchange student in, in uh, within the framework of that program, I actually hadn't ever traveled beyond Canada and the United States at that time. And now I've traveled uh, in, in many different places and, and learned many different things as a result of that. And so I, I want to touch on that theme. But, but Western gave me the opportunity to actually head my, my professional career in that, that kind of a direction. Um, so I, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is uh, is this topic at the front, and inclusive innovation driving a sustainable future. And I should share with you that I I, uh, I shared this with my daughter, who's a graduate student now in mechanical engineering. She she, she flunked chemistry, so that's where she ended up. <laughs> um, I shared this title with her the, the other day as I was I was talking about coming to Western and. And, and she, she criticized me for putting in so many corporate buzzwords all in the same title. And it is, it is true there are corporate buzzwords there, and I'll probably use corporate buzzwords as I, as I walk through my presentation a little bit. But there are also concepts behind them that are real, beyond the hype. And, and hopefully you'll get a bit of a sense of how I think about that kind of stuff going forward. Um, nobody told me how to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I, I want to. I'm going to have sort of three things I'm going to talk about um, as I go through my, my my talk this morning. If any of you follow the uh, political situation in the United States, you know that if you say you're going to talk about three things, you should at least either write them down so that if you forget the third one after the second, one, you have something to refer to, or you should say something different. You know, the other way to do this is I'm going to talk about several things and then just start to enumerate them, and you can stop wherever you want. So I'm going to talk about three, and I've written them down here just to make sure that I don't fall into the same trap as other people have recently. Um, I'm going to talk about sustainability challenges and opportunities, and, and I'm going to talk about that because what that, that does for us in our company, working in science and technology, is it, it provides direction by which we channel our efforts to where, to where there's opportunities not only to contribute to making the planet a better and a safer place, but also being able to be successful from a commercial standpoint. I'm going to then talk about the changing nature of innovation. I'll share with you, uh, those of you that don't know DuPont very well, it's a, it's, a, it's a very old company and it's got a, a rich legacy of science and technology. But the nature of the way we do innovation now is markedly different than even what it was when I first joined as a research scientist uh, about 25 years ago. And then I want to finish talking to revisit that uh, notion about the importance of multi-dimensional characteristics in, as a scientist and, and, and internationalism and the role that it plays going forward and, and being able to master some of those concepts but also integrate that into what you bring to the table as you think about your career. <clears throat> so let, let me just uh, talk about uh, DuPont a little bit in a, in a bit of an abstract sense. As I said, it's an old company. It's 209 years old. It's one of the oldest industrial companies in, in North America. It was started by a French immigrant who had worked with Lavoisier and came to the United States 
to, to uh, start an explosives business and, and ran that explosives business for almost all of the 19th century. It was focused in, in specifically in, in one narrow, relatively narrow domain and one narrow domain relative to the chemistry associated with it. Um, it was in that period, though, that where DuPont actually developed some of the what we call core values that still reside in the company today. When you run an explosives business, uh, it's inherently hazardous to uh, actually uh, make the product and ship the product and handle the product to, because of the nature of what its intent is. And, 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 and so DuPont actually became famous during that period for uh, managing inherently hazardous processes safely and it takes a lot of pride associated with it. So there's a folkloric story about the uh, uh, E.I. DuPont, the, the uh, founder of the company, actually building his house within blast range of the uh, of the uh, manufacturing equipment associated with uh, with making gunpowder at the time, as a demonstration of his allegiance toward not only the safety of himself but the safety of his employees in the in the process. And and and, and when that, whenever you come actually into this environment in DuPont. You, you're really kind of shocked at the beginning of, from a cultural point of view when you see kind of the obsessive behavior that we have relative to sci uh, safety within the, our operating environment and our manufacturing environments. But over time, that gets translated into something that truly is of greater value. It's, it's, it, you, you come to know it as another core value, and that's uh, how we value the people that we work with in our professional lives. Coming out of the 19th century then, uh, there was a need to diversify for a whole lot of different reasons. And one of which was the fact that during the, uh, World War I, almost all the dye stuffs that came into the United States were supplied by Germany. And then as a result of World War I, it was no longer possible actually to, 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 to import those products into the United States. So DuPont got a mandate to get into the dye business, get into the textile business. And, and partly because of that, but partly because of the other dynamics in the industry, we started to diversify our portfolio and diversify our science base. And that took us through, like it did actually in the chemical industry in general in North America and, and globally, a, 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 an extremely rich period during which uh, many, many different technologies uh, evolved forward. And some of them uh, DuPont participated in very, very actively. In, in polymerization, for example, and the synthetic fibers re re revolution that flowed from that. And so some of the things, if you do know anything about DuPont, you'll associate it with Freon and Teflon and Nylon and Lycra and Kevlar and those kinds of products that were all a result of an explosion of diversified chemical chemistry and chemical engineering that occurred during the, uh, during the sort of uh, post-war period in the, in, the, in the 20th century and continued to drive the company's uh, performance and, and, uh, and uh, activity level right through to near the end of the 20th century. Um, one of the things that I discovered when I finally graduated from DuPont and got a real job, or got, graduated from Western and got a real job, was that was, so this is a period where inside of the company there was a tremendous amount of chemical engineering development going on. In the, I went back to my Perry's Chemical Engineering Handbook and discovered that Perry himself actually wrote the first version of this as a DuPont employee. And many of the articles written in that, in that and many of the textbooks that flowed from that actually were, were DuPont. So we nurtured chemical engineering and chemical sciences during that period in a really uh, quite uh, remarkable way. But like any industry and any company that lasts for 200 years, it has a need to renew itself on a regular occasion, on, on, a, on a regular basis. It doesn't happen once a century necessarily, but uh, in fact it happens even more frequently now to be able to say, sustain one's uh, business uh, overall. And by the time we got near the end of the 20th century, much of what carried the company during that, uh, that, that rich period of uh, post-war um, were becoming commoditized. So the, the technology associated with polyester had, Reached the, reached the billions of pounds level and was being produced all over the world, increasingly in Asia by lower cost producers. So we had a need to take a step back and say to ourselves, what is in fact going to drive the third century in, du in DuPont as we got near the end of the, end of the 20th century? And, and what, what's going to take us forward from here? And so we went through a process of, as actually we discussed this a little bit this morning, of saying, well, is, is life sciences uh, where we want to play? Uh, at that point in time, we had a presence in pharmaceutical, pharmaceuticals, but a, a subcritical mass presence in pharmaceuticals. 
we thought about maybe energy uh, in the petroleum sense of the word was, was where we needed to play because we could enhance our cost position by integrating upstream and having access to low cost raw materials to be able to drive our, our chemicals business. And in fact, we bought the Conoco oil company and owned it for about a decade or so in the 1980s and, and, and early 90s. But then what we, uh, and then we sort of asked ourselves, well, what are the product trends, in, in fact, to, from a needs basis going forward? And, and, and certainly, as you'll see in a minute, we've, we've tried to become a much more market-driven, customer-oriented uh, company in our evolution. Uh, but we wanted to look for things that would actually be persistent trends that would be able to carry us over a longer period of time. And then little by little st stumbled on, on this, and that is, um, October 31st, I don't know where it was, in India somewhere, the population of the world reached the 7 billion mark and in fact is projected to increase to, 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 to another 2 billion by the time we get to 2050. In a sustainable, in a, in a way that needs to be done sustainably. But, but what, whatever happens, this is going to create a dynamic in the economic structure of the world and the business structure of, of the world that's going to create enormous challenges on one hand and in enormous uh, opportunities on the other hand if you're able to position your science and technology in a way to be able to bring solutions to some of these problems that that represents. Second thing that's happening is that increase in population if you look at it extrapolated from 2010 to 2050, 30 times more of that increase in population is going to occur in the developing countries versus the developed countries, half of which is going to be in Asia. So for a company like ours, what this means is not only um, not only are our core markets going to change and the opportunities to be able to participate in markets going to change, but the nature of our offerings and our technologies need to change and adapt to be associated with that. So as, as recently as 2000, uh, uh, DuPont sales on a global basis were 75 percent con concentrated in Canada, the United States, and Western Europe, with a, a very small portion um, focused in, uh, in, the, in the developing world, as little as just over 10 years ago. Whereas today, 35% of our sales are in, de in, in, the, in the developing world, more than they are in the United States in total. So this shift meant a number of things. It meant that, number one, the opportunities in the marketplace are, are going to grow more so in develop, developing countries than, de than, than, than developed. And then in addition to that, as these developing com countries actually develop, the nature of their needs are, are going to shift. And so, uh, as you heard in the introduction, I spent most of the last five years in China. What you see in China, uh, even during that very small little slice of history, you saw China go from being almost inconsequential in terms of automotive production to being the largest single market and the largest single production uh, country in automotive you know, in, in the world. So that emergence of the middle class that's going to come along with this population change is going to be really dramatic in nature. And what does that lead to? It leads to, in fact, opportunities and challenges for companies like ours. In moving to, to, to 2050 to 9 billion people in terms of overall population of the world, the, 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 the need to continue to increase food production is going to amplify by about 70 percent. 70 percent more needs to be produced in 2050 than needs to be produced today as a result of this population growth, number one, but also as a result of the nature of the changing diets that go along with an economic evolution that's going to take place in that area. However, uh, the price of oil is priced this week or last week or next month or the following month, the fact of the matter is fossil fuels is not a sustainable long-term uh, energy source relative to the planet. And unless we have technologies to diversify our energy consumptions overall, we're going to find ourselves in a, in a position where we can't sustain things going forward. So this opens all kinds of opportunities in terms of uh, photovoltaics, in terms of biofuels, in terms of all kinds of alternate energy technologies. And then again, if I look back on uh, the, 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 you know, the rapid development that's, that's taken place in China over the last number of years, 
the stress of that environment, of that development on the environment and on the people in that in environment uh, presents a tremendous number of stresses and opportunities for companies to be able to find solutions to be able to make this development more ultimately sustainable. So there's all kinds of economic issues and social issues associated with this development, but science, if you're a science company like we pretend to be in DuPont, has an opportunity to contribute uh, massively to being able to address these problems. So that's where we're focusing our company. We've picked three kind of core technology areas to be able to move into the third century here. Agriculture and nutrition, production agriculture, where the need to have crops that produce more food on a given amount of arable land is, is really intense and, and pro provides a, a terrific opportunity for us. Our advanced materials business, which is what we sort of traditionally associate with DuPont and in the kinds of things that I talked about earlier, polymers and fibers and electronics, electronics materials and that sort of thing, have a way to contribute to alternate energy technologies. For example, we're the largest supplier of non-silicon based materials into the photovoltaic industry now. We have uh, very large programs on developing advanced polymers to be able to lightweight cars to be able to make them more fuel efficient. And then this emerging part in the area where we've kind of incubated our presence uh, uh, a gener uh, 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 organically in DuPont for about the last 10 years of bringing the richness of biosciences to combine with some of those technologies in agriculture and in advanced material science to be able to produce renewable materials, for example, or materials that come from renewable resources using not petroleum-based uh, technologies, but using uh, the biosciences, being able to do metabolic engineering to be able to have microbes convert sugars into things that are useful <coughs> value and can substitute in that area. And if you marry all these together, frankly, we have what I, what I think at least is, 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 a, is a kind of a unique combination of, uh, of businesses in the company. So if you look at production agriculture, we have some formidable competitors. Monsanto is the one you hear about all the time. If you look at advanced material science, we have we have competitors in VSF and Dow and other people that play in that domain. Uh, we have competitors in industrial biotech. There's a, a company called Novozymes that, uh, and DSM has a, a position in those those kinds of areas. But we have actually a unique opportunity of, of being able to marry these three science areas together in such a way as to create competitive advantage that, in fact, none of our competitors, in my view, have an opportunity to do. So as we so we've picked where we want to play, and we've we've picked uh, uh, the the science domains. We've sort of uh, latched our kite to things that we think are going to be persistent in terms of the trends that will occur in the in the planet over the next decades to come. What we now have to ask ourselves is how do we do innovation in this environment? A lot of um, a lot of the innovation that was done in the previous sort of uh, incarnation of Dupont was what we call product push, where we very often we invented something that, like Lycra, for example, which nobody else had, and our job was, in a marketing sense, was to be able to produce as much of it as we wanted and then allocate that to deserve customers around the world. That's what we called marketing in DuPont at the time, is, is invent something that nobody else has and then allocate it into the marketplace. That's no longer something that with the nature of the evolution of technology, with the competitive forces at play in the, in, the, in the world, we're able to do. So we have to do shift to a different innovation model to be able to be successful. What it, so what does that look like? It looks like being more market driven. It still needs to be science based. Uh, our, our, the fundamental source of our competitive advantage, we believe, is the underlying sciences associated with what we do. It has to be more global in character, it has to be more sustainable, and it has to be more inclusive. And I'd like to just talk about each of these five topics just for a bit to give you a better sense of what that is. So, as I said, very often, um, uh, DuPont as a, as a company doesn't have a very strong reputation of being a good <coughs> marketing company, and that's because we didn't have to for most of our existence uh, during, uh, during the first couple of centuries. Today, we don't start any R&D program or, or science and technology program in the company without first doing an assessment of the market opportunity associated with it, formulating a value proposition, how we're going to make money associated with doing that, 
and then continuing up to update that market intelligence and the business plan associated with bringing that commercial or te technology toward commercialization through the evolution of, of, it, of, of, of its life. And we work in, if you look at our portfolio, we work on things that are short-term um, uh, de deliverables. We have projects that we do applications development for, for example, that have a time horizon of, 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 of a couple of months. We also have things that we work on that actually have time horizons that go beyond a, a decade in, in nature. And we apply the same market association, market-driven uh, methodologies associated with developing them in all of those different time frames. Our science base is diverse, and understanding how we can bring this distinctive competitive advantage into these market opportunities is, is a really important part of what my responsibilities are within science and technology in DuPont. But this is, a, it is a, an illustration of is where we've decided to continue to nurture the fundamental sciences that bring about uh, uh, creating the, 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 uh, the competitive advantage in, in our product base. And so what you see on this is, on the left-hand side, you see things like uh, catalysis, like uh, organic synthesis, things that are, are kind of traditional science bases uh, in, in DuPont. On the right-hand side, you see some of the things that we've developed over the last decade or two that are in the agricultural biotechnology sphere. And as these move, merge toward e each other, you see a sprinkling and an increased introduction of industrial biotechnology that in fact can marry the two together to be able to bring something that's truly distinctive. So these are the areas that we've chosen to nurture internally within the company and where we look by looking at what takes place when you integrate these technologies together at the interface and how you can create that, uh, value in the process. So actively managing our science base and our science competency base is fundamental to, to being able to innovate going forward. Third one, globalization. Um, as I said, most of the growth in the in opportunities uh, that we see going forward are going to come from different regions. When we first go to a region, when we first started selling in China, for example, in the, in the early 1990s, what we did is we sold products that we had developed for developed markets elsewhere in the world, and we just channeled them into the China market. And frankly, for about the first decade of our presence in China, that was a pretty good strategy. We were able to grow with China. The, the competitive environment wasn't, wasn't too intense. Uh, but very quickly thereafter, um, the, the China economy has evolved to a much higher degree of sophistication. The market there has evolved to a much higher degree of sophistication. And so the richness of the science and technology base that we had in, developing country, in developed countries needs to be made accessible to the people in developing countries in order to be able to stay and maintain our competitive position. So we go about doing this in two different ways. One, one is we have, uh, in the last decade, built uh, a major uh, R&D facilities in Shanghai, in Hyderabad, and in Brazil to be able to house science and technology people that will work directly on meeting the needs of those markets. But even more importantly, we have a global network of over 9,000 scientists in, in our company and being able to shift the focus of their efforts toward working on problems associated with developing economies and without picking them up and moving them to those developing economies it is a very high uh, a, a priority for us. So you can see we have lots of R&D facilities. We've got 150 or more around the world of, of different facilities. Many of those are small. Many of them are associated with, uh, with agricultural technology where we do breeding in the market where we're going to plant the crop ultimately. But they sort of cascade up in, uh, into a hierarchy where we've probably got 25 or, or more that are of a significant scale around the world, and then uh, a half a dozen or so that really uh, are, 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 are critical mass in multiple different technology domains. So getting the globalization, getting the richness of our, our technology accessible to those markets where, that are growing around the world is, is a fundamentally important thing for us to do. More sustainable. We, uh, as a company, we set what we call sustainability goals for 2010, back in, two, in, in 1995, and then worked toward achieving them. And when we did achieve them uh, in about 2008, so a couple of years ahead of, uh, of, um, of uh, what we had planned. 
But if you look back at those goals, most of those goals were sustainability goals, but they almost all had to do with reducing our environmental footprint around the world, reducing the harm that we do as a result of our presence and our business presence. And so working on them was really important, but it wasn't in this true spirit of sustainability in the same sense as it is today, where we see, see sustainability not only of, of, uh, of reducing our environmental footprint, but engaging in the economies that we work in and creating shareholder value in a much broader concept, con context as a result of sustainability. So when we started our R&D program, in, in addition to doing the market analysis that I talked about earlier, we also do a sustainability analysis on all of the products that we bring into the marketplace in advance of being, uh, undergoing the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the development process overall. And you can see, I'm ahead of myself, you can see the kinds of things that we take into account as we move our products forward. We've also set goals, for example, of doubling our R&D spend associated with sustainability. Uh, as you saw in the previous chart, we, we spend close to $2 billion a year on R&D, and we're, we're spending an increasing percentage of that on directly related to products that, we, that fit our sustainability criteria. And in fact, another of our, our goals that, that is market linked in a sustainability context is we've got goals that uh, set to, in fact, develop our technologies that enable our customers downstream to be more sustainable in the way they go about business on a, on a, on a, in, the, in the context of where they, they, they play in the supply chain. So this is real and, and important for us. The last three ch charts are on the notion of inclusiveness, inclusive innovation, which is kind of a corporate buzzword. But the reality is, you saw earlier that we have a rich array of technologies that we have in-house in our company, but not a sufficient uh, array to be able to address all the dimensions of some of the challenges we have associated with our megatrends. <clears throat> so what do we do then is we engage in partnerships. We engage in partnerships with ventures where we buy a position in a small company to be able to get access to the technology or get access to the thinking associated with technologies that we don't have in our own competency base. We, we need to uh, interact uh, more and more in the complex, the global regulated environment around food technologies with, uh, with government authorities, with, uh, with downstream partners and food companies to be able to address some of the challenges and problems associated with it. So it's, it's rare today that we would do a development in any of our technology areas without some uh, degree of external collaboration, either at an NGO level, or a government level, at a customer level. And these uh, uh, next couple of charts give you examples of them relative to addressing the, the challenges around food, relative to addressing the challenges around renewable energy sources. So we do all of our lightweighting um, work in polymers to be able to do metal replacements in automobiles directly with automobile companies. We do a lot of it with Toyota, for example, because we have a leadership position around in integrating some of these technologies in, into the four. We do biotechnology and we've got major programs on biomaterials and biofuels that uh, reduce the dependence on fossil fuels as well that we do in the framework of joint ventures and in the framework of science partnerships uh, going forward. And then in, 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 uh, in protecting lives and the environment, almost everything we do again is in a regulated domain uh, of some sort where we make bulletproof vests, for example, to, to protect the people that are in the, in, in the military. And we do this in a collaborative fashion to be able to set standards and be able to ensure that those standards are, are met. We work uh, from my, I referred to earlier, our core value of safety. We've actually extended that to become a commercial business. And we have partnerships with major oil companies to be able to take some of the practices that we've developed in DuPont and keeping people safe in a hazardous process environment, safe in that petroleum uh, produce, producing environment. And we do that in, a, in the context of, of, um, of alliances and partnerships. So now, now let me just kind of conclude and, and address the question of, well, if you're excited by science and you're excited by the opportunities, that are represented by the global megatrends that we've talked about. What kind of attributes do you need to nurture and develop as an individual in order to be able to participate in something that isn't just straight science, but requires uh, an understanding and appreciation for the market environment, 
it needs to be global in context, needs to live the values associated with sustainability, and, and, is, and, and, and is ultimately uh, working in the context of a, a, a teeming environment. And so my answer to that is the people that have in fact looked at these qualities of uh, uh, success factors associated with, with doing this kind of work and nurtured them within the context of their career. And so let me bring you back to what I talked to, to, to at, the, at the beginning. As a result of Western allowing me to participate in this exchange program, I, I spent enough time, I spent actually six years in total, li living in France and developed a, uh, an, an appreciation for that new culture that was intimidating to me uh, personally at the very beginning. I didn't speak French very well at all. The French are not always patient in, in uh, having people come into their environment and, 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 uh, and, and sort of put up with them during that development period. But I stayed long enough to actually walk away with what I thought was an appreciation not only of the French culture, but of my own culture that was very different than I had before. And what that did, frankly, I think positioned me to to be when, when DuPont was looking to see who would be a, a good candidate for the president of DuPont Mexico, that I was positioned well to be able to, to, to do that. So, so my, my sort of appeal to you as you look forward to developing your own uh, careers, look for opportunities that allow you to, to, to develop these kinds of attributes. By the way, the people on the bottom here are my daughters. The one with the, uh, the umbrella is the mechanical engineer. You could tell that, right? <laughs> But when we were uh, living in Hong Kong, actually, um, and my daughters had already gone through sort of many uh, cultural transitions in their, in their own personal development. And what we stumbled upon sort of uh, just by accident was a, a book that was written about uh, people that have international opportunities as children uh, called Third Culture Kids. And, and uh, a third culture kid, if you've ever heard the concept is, is, is a kid, when you ask them where they're from, they don't know how to answer the question. <laughs> it's too complex and complicated. But what they do find is a third culture is they're not, not a part of the culture from which they originate. They're not a part of the culture in which they're living. They're a part of a culture that's sort of superimposed on the total, seeing it from a very distinctive and a different vantage point. And I've personally uh, 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 benefited from having had those experiences uh, and my daughters have uh, benefited from having those kinds of experiences. And, and they're, the, they're the kind of people with the diverse array of scientists that we have in DuPont that are able to really think of themselves as multidimensional, think of themselves as multicultural in, in their approach to what are multicultural problems uh, in the world. So I to just close with that. Um, I, I, I thank Western for giving me the opportunity to embark on a path to have amassed uh, uh, learnings in this area and I'd, I'd be really anxious to hear if you have questions that you want to pose in this area or associated ones. So, uh, I'm happy to talk to you about that now.